Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Convocation 2016, fall 2016. We're excited that you've taken this time to join us for Convocation, and we hope that you really have a great evening here with us. At this time, we're going to begin our proceedings with a bow. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Leary Nurse. I am the Dean of Students within the Office of Student Affairs. And we are, I'm excited to just be here to share in this very special occasion with you. This is my first convocation, and I'm excited just to experience this wonderful, wonderful experience here. At this time, I'm going to introduce Reverend Jason Hayes. He's going to do our invocation for you. Jason is a pastor, spiritual director, and teacher. His current research interests include fluid identities, post-structuralist pastoral theologies of embodiment, narrative therapy within congregational and community contexts, and deaf studies. Prior to joining the faculty at Naropa University, Jason served as associate minister for pastoral care and congregational life at First Congregational Church in Boulder, Colorado from 2006 to 2015 an associate pastor of Christ Church of the Death in Baltimore, Maryland. He also serves as a pastoral counselor in private practice in Boulder, Colorado. At this time, welcome Professor, Professor Reverend Jason Hayes. I would invite you in whatever way your practice leads you to um, become centered in this space and perhaps uh, become aware of your body. Take a deep breath. Perhaps close your eyes or avert your gaze. Oh, wisdom beyond all wisdom. May our hearts be cracked open today that gratitude might pour out for this gathering of community, for the earth below that supports us, for the sky above, for these sacred moments of pausing as we mark a new beginning for our founder, and for the diversity of lineages here in this place, and for those who have gone before, for those who have nurtured us, taught us, nudged us to arrive here at this place, and, and let us grieve for those who aren't here today. O oh, light beyond all light, flame our purest intentions and burn away the fog of our indifference that we might see each other clearly, offering hospitality to the stranger, enacting compassion to our classmates and colleagues, embodying our presence with one another as co-learners, and let us find courage to claim our voices and to speak our truths, especially to power. O oh, mystery beyond all mysteries, may we be moved towards generosity with one another as we share gifts of body, mind, and spirit that we might be alive and awake to listen to the life stories and the wisdom of those around us, especially when they're different from us. 
that we might offer to one another charity in the midst of adversity and conflict. And let us strive for reconciliation and humility when we have caused harm. O oh, knowledge beyond all knowledge, may our intellect be inspired this academic year that we might find crystal clarity of vision and intention, that we might be disrupted in our complacency, transformed in our curiosities and learnings, and as a result, may we be aroused towards transformative service to a world in need. May it be so. May it truly be so. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Our Provost Dr. Janet Kramer has served as both an administrator and a scholar. Janet Kramer earned her PhD in mass communications with a minor in feminist studies and brings many years of higher education experience to Naropa. Before her arrival at Naropa, Janet worked as Associate Provost for Assessment and Instruction as well as professor in the School of Communications and Media Studies at Florida Atlantic University. She has also held many academic and administrative posts at the University of New Mexico, including Dean of Curriculum and Instruction, Director of Women's Studies, and the Director of the Preparing Future Faculty Program. Dr. Kramer also spent nine years in Rochester, Minnesota as Director of Communications for the Sisters of St. Francis, a spiritual community working internationally in the areas of education, arts, healthcare, homelessness, peace and justice, and ecology. At this time, welcome our Provost, Dr. Janet Kramer. begin my remarks by first acknowledging uh, those of you who are at this ceremony for the first time. And I'll begin with introducing our new faculty. And as I say your name, if you would just stand and then stay standing. Uh, Stephen Polk. Stephen joins us as an assistant professor in the Environmental Studies program. Stephen received his MA from CU Denver in political science studying permaculture. He's worked primarily on a community level, addressing issues ranging from anti-oppression and truly affordable housing to the construction of regenerative systems in communal settings. Dr. Jordan Qualia. Jordan joins us as an assistant professor in the Contemplative Psychology program. He received an MA in Transpersonal Counseling Psychology here at Naropa and just finished his doctorate at Virginia Commonwealth University in experimental psychology. During his doctoral training, he was awarded Mind and Life Institute's Francisco J. Varela Award for his dissertation project on mindful emotion regulation in social contexts. Dr. Travis Cox. Travis joins us as an associate professor in our Eco-Psychology MA program. His interests and research are about the intersections of social movements and social justice, metaphysics, environmental philosophy, agriculture, and deep sustain sustainability, an area in which he has also taught for the past seven years at a university in Iowa. Travis earned his PhD in sustainable agriculture at Iowa State University. Dr. Mickey Fire. 
Mickey joins us as an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Counseling and Psychology and will be teaching in both the Transpersonal Wilderness Therapy Program and the Mindfulness-Based Transpersonal Counseling Psychology Program. She received her PhD in psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies. Leah Friedman. Leah joins us as an instructor in our undergraduate and graduate art therapy programs. She is a board certified art therapist, educator, facilitator, and specialist in therapeutic relationships and group dynamics. And she earned her MA in art therapy uh, from Naropa. Jeffrey Pethybridge. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Jeffrey joins us as an instructor in the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University, where he is also the managing director of the summer writing program, a position he held in an interim capacity this past summer and did an outstanding job. Jeffrey studied literature and creative writing at Old Dominion University, Boston University, and received his PhD from the University of, Min of Missouri and has authored several works. And then are there any new adjunct faculty here today? If you could just stand. Okay, well, please join me in welcoming the new faculty. And now you're going to stand up again because now I would like to ask anyone who is here for the first time, faculty, staff, or student, to please stand. Yay. So my remarks this morning are really designed for these new folks. Uh, it is customary for the provost to offer a welcome to the year, and yet it's something that I must admit to struggling with on some level. Uh, not the idea of welcome, certainly, which is open, hospitable, celebratory, warm, all good things, and I certainly wouldn't want my remarks to take away from that. Um, but I struggle more with this idea about what um, welcome can denote. Primarily that there is something to be welcomed into. And then following that, this idea that there is something to belong to. And that's, I guess, what I'm uneasy with. Uh, it has to do with this idea of belonging, especially when you're new. I don't know about you, but I often struggle with with it myself. I've just been here three years, too, by the way, so I'm still feeling kind of like a newcomer. Um, but I've often felt as if I don't belong. Uh, when I was growing up, knowing I was lesbian and not feeling much like a girl, uh, dressing like one or caring about what other girls seem to care about, uh, one of my favorite stories was that animated or claymation TV special about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> yeah, you know, the one with Burl Ives and the Abominable Snowman. Yeah. Well, my favorite part of that uh, Christmas classic is when Rudolph, who feels like a misfit because of his red nose, joins up with Herbie, who also feels like a misfit because he doesn't want to be an elf, he wants to be a dentist. <laughs> and they travel together to the island of misfit toys where they think they will finally find a home. But the king of the island tells them that the island is only for misfit toys. Yeah. <laughs> Not for misfit reindeers or elves. Which prompts their traveling companion, Yukon Cornelius, to laugh and say, how do you like that? Even among misfits, you're a misfit. <laughs> and I love that line. I loved it then, I love it now. And then the other classic story for all of us, of course, is the one of the ugly duckling. The duckling who is told she is ugly, is rejected, struggles to exist with her supposed ugliness, tries to conform, is unable to, and then finally discovers that she isn't a duck after all. She is a swan. And when she realizes that she was trying to be something she wasn't, she really enjoys being a swan among swans which is a lovely ending to a story of our poor duck who struggled to belong. But sometimes, like Rudolph, it's possible to be a misfit among misfits. And what do you do then? Well, I think that if you feel like a misfit, Naropa is your place. <laughs> You 
you are among your swans. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that this should lead to instant comfort. Um, for a time, I think there is, and maybe naturally is, distrust in a new place. Do these people really regard me? Am I really safe here? Will I be chased away? Is it okay to act like who I am? Please do. Because we don't need conformity. We don't need sameness. Whether it is among humans, or in art, or in music, or in nature, sameness will never lead to what is vibrant and sustainable in a life-giving way. We depend on our diversity. We depend, in some ways, on not belonging. And yet we do have a longing that we feel for our own kind, like the duck felt for the swans before she realized she was one. And I would like to suggest that the kind we are, and I'm not saying we're perfect by any means, but the kind that we are and that we nurture here at Naropa is about authenticity and service, of being your own true self and recognizing the responsibility of that gift. Naropa watched one of its longtime staff members retire from the provost's office this summer. Her name was Judith Sumner, and she loved this place. On her last day, while we were saying our final goodbyes, she talked about the long graduate program. That's how she described it. The long graduate program that is Naropa. And about a curriculum that is not just conceptual. There is something that happens to the heart, she said. There is brilliance here. Those who come, come with that brilliance. And then this place draws something even more out of them. And I was actually inspired by that, and it's what led to this talk, really. So for today's welcome, whether you feel like a misfit or not, whether Naropa is perfect or not, I want to say hold out, hold on, do your work, do your art, do your movement. You are among your swans. You are among other wild, authentic beings. Every day, in myriad individual ways, each of us benefits from and contributes to what makes this university truly special. And not just in our successes, but more profoundly in our brokenness, in our pain, in our loneliness, and in the ways we think we do not belong. And so in that spirit, I can welcome you. I can welcome you to the journey, to this amazing place, to walk with others like and unlike you. Welcome to Naropa, and to all of us, welcome to the year. Thank you so much, Provost Kramer. I'm a swan. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's, that's going to stick with me. I know as a child growing up, I would always um, read the story about the ugly duckling, but it's really good to get a different perspective. And what better place to have that perspective than at Naropa? So thank you once again. We'd be having our president come at this time to give a welcome, but just let me tell you a little bit about this. the man, President Chuck Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> so, our president, Charles Chuck Leaf, was named the seventh president of Naropa University in 2012 after, and I'm gonna stress here, after a deep 40-year affiliation with Naropa first as a student of Naropa's founder, then as a lawyer for the university, and later as chairman of the board. Under President Lee's leadership, Naropa University has developed strategic partnerships to deepen Naropa's impact on its students and on the world. Prior to assuming his current role, 
Chuck led some of the country's most innovative and successful organizations, providing integrated social enterprises and social services, including the Greystone Foundation and Amida Care, which together provided essential housing, health care, and employment to the thousands of low-income people in the Northeast. He earned a BA from Brandeis University and a JD from the University of Colorado School of Law. At this time, welcome our president, President Charles Chuck Leaf. So, so this, this is a problem. Generally speaking, we structure this so that nobody good speaks before me. <laughs> so I'm now completely confused about what, what to, not that Leary's not good, but, but yeah, so this is, this is not good. <laughs> and I actually, so I had this talk that I wrote, but I actually have notes from the uh, graduation talk that I gave to the Alia Preschool uh, in June, uh, which actually, since I held their attention for 90 seconds, it might be a better, I realize, might be better. But it does include a message that people should thank their parents. So that's probably whatever. I didn't think about that in this talk, but you should thank our parents. It seems good. Uh, this is really hard. Um, <laughs> So I am delighted to welcome uh, the Naropa students, faculty, staff, uh, members, I think more than one, of the Board of Trustees uh, and guests to the Naropa community for the opening of this academic year. Uh, I'm especially happy to invite our new undergraduate and graduate students. Thank you for being here. Thank you for standing up and being acknowledged. And certainly to welcome our new faculty and staff as well. Um, we, I, I will promise that we will have a longer, more comprehensive introduction of new staff as well, which uh, I don't have enough written down to do it justice here, but we'll do something in writing uh, there quite soon. Uh, I also want to thank the members of the uh, organizing committee for the convocation who spent a lot of time over the summer planning for this event. Um, as we pro you're probably picking up, uh, those of you that are somewhat new to Naropa and certainly people that have been here for a while know, ritual and ceremony and celebration have been important parts of our 42-year uh, history and is some of the ways in which a community which is spread out across Boulder can share with each other. Uh, what we choose to share, I think, is wide open. Uh, there's always this opportunity to share wisdom or to share our stubbornness. Uh, to share compassion or to share greed, uh, to share effective action or to share numbness, uh, share our skill in falling asleep or share waking up. Uh, it's all available to us. Uh, our founder and my teacher, Trigyam Trungpa Rinpoche, was a master of irritatingly straightforward teaching. And he answered the fundamental question about what to share by simply saying, it's up to you. And he shrugged. Um, <laughs> it seemed pithy and deep at the time. It would came, turned out it was a very complicated teaching as we uh, worked with it. But it really is up to you. Um, in many ways, framing the questions I think that we have are the, is the easy part of our journey together. And discovering the answers is altogether more challenging. Uh, as we embark together on important work at Naropa, it seems important to me that we acknowledge the privilege, privileged place that we find ourselves inhabiting right now. That's been the case at Naropa since the first bow in 1974 down on Broadway and Arapaho. Uh, I'd argue that our privileged place in the world is more starkly apparent now than at any time in human history. Um, my view is informed by the fact that we're resident in a world where it's virtually impossible today to hide poverty, aggression, and suffering. If ignorance is bliss was ever an excuse for inaction, it's not credible in the least in 2016 to feign ignorance because it's impossible to not be aware of what's going on around us. And if there was ever, from my point of view, an obligation to serve or support our fellow sentient beings and to serve the inanimate world that we inhabit, uh, and often exploit, uh, I think that obligation is now. 
I feel the urgency of this situation more now, I think, than I did 42 years ago uh, at our first summer session, and probably it's because I'm 40 years, 42 years nearer to being unable to make a difference. Um, many of you here have a lot of years in front of you to be able to make that difference, but the urgency grows over time. Um, whatever the reason, I think, for action, I believe in the power of reminder and in the power of challenge. Uh, I've noted in past convocations, and I think it's important to always note that, that this is the anniversary week of the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think the first conv convocation that I spoke at was the actual date, the anniversary date, but uh, it happened uh, on the 28th of, of August. Um, beyond the dream that Dr. King spoke about, <clears throat> He also made a statement that I've brought up at other convocation talks that to me clearly state the reason that Naropa was founded a short 11 years after that um, remarkable moment in human history. Uh, Dr. King said, we've also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. I can say with some confidence that Trungpa Rinpoche felt that urgency when, as a 19-year-old monk, he led hundreds of uh, people across the Himalayas to escape political and spiritual oppression. Uh, that is, at his convocation talk in 1974, um, his antidote for cooling off was to light the pilot light. And for those, many of you, I'm sure, have seen videos of that talk, and if you haven't, I suggest that you do. Uh, he suggested that we light a pilot light which would create a spark and that that spark actually ignited what is Naropa today. Um, Naropa was his means to transmit a realization of the Buddhist path in a radical way, even by dropping religious orthodoxy and in its place encouraging non-sectarian sanity, skillful means, and compassion. And I think for four decades plus, People, members of this community have tried very hard to uh, uh, understand, honor, and propagate that legacy. Not always as well as we could, but I think fundamentally the intention has always been there. Our community clearly does welcome students who arrive here already fully engaged in the world, who bring rich life experience, some inspiring, some painful, and have the generosity to share those experiences with the rest of us. And we also welcome those who are seekers, uh, willing to jump into the Naropa cauldron with some hesitation. I can't imagine anybody hasn't hesitated at least a little bit, and a lot of bravery. Uh, and we, that combination, I think, allows us to aspire to wake up together, to grow together, uh, and to change the world together. If we aspire to be warriors in the world, and that appears from time to time in Naropa literature, bringing fresh energy, humble intention, and effective action to meet the issues of social and economic justice, oppression and privilege, and the profound lack of kindness and compassion and manifest violence that are experienced by so many hundreds of millions of people in this world every single day, then we need to be prepared. Naropa indeed is a place of privilege, but the privilege itself is relative, and it's our duty to also, within our own community, hear our classmates, hear our staff and faculty colleagues, and allow them to speak of their own personal stories of injustice and oppression, even within the privileged, relatively privileged space that we all hold. And what's even better, I think, than allowing space to hear those stories is for us each to initiate actions to undermine that oppression before those same colleagues need to point it out to us at all. Uh, I don't think it's the job of people who have feel oppressed, who have feel that they are subject to bias, um, to have to point out those experiences as if they're also obliged to be journalists, um, sharing the story of their own experience to us, the interested audience. I think it's a job that we have to actually take a step first. We do that work here at Naropa in large part from this foundation of contemplative education. Uh, contemplative education at Naropa, which you already know, is uh, more than another way to practice mindfulness. Although mindfulness, of course, is certainly a significant part of the work that we do. Despite uh, a view that maybe some of us had before we spent much time at Naropa or much time practicing with a genuine contemplative teacher, um, there is a view that anything contemplative is by nature inward focused and somewhat passive. A Naropa education, I can say, is anything but. It's active, practice anywhere, applied to virtually anything we do. 
Our goal at Naropa is actually not to train contemplative practitioners. Rather, it's to share a kind of a, a means, a set of tools, uh, by which each student at Naropa can actually lead a contemplative life, both here and when you go on from here. Uh, whatever vehicles you use to live that life and to uh, uh, evolve your own contemplative being is completely personal and it's completely up to you. Our job, I think, is to provide uh, the means by which you can explore that for yourself. I think that contemplative education is one of the most powerful means to overcome the temptation that Dr. King described to cool off or to move gradually through our world. To me, the contemplative practitioner experiences many things, and I think that probably rings true for, for many of us here. Realization, fogginess, waking up, falling asleep, deepening compassion toward ourselves and the world that we inhabit, and so on. But in many ways, um, in my experience, none of those uh, uh, manifestations um, wear the cloak of gradualism. We wake up, we go to sleep, we're compassionate, we're not compassionate, we're irritating, we're kind, moment by moment by moment by moment, and there's nothing gradual about it. It's actually shocking that way, how quickly things arise and how quickly they fall. <laughs> um, they can be, these experiences will be abrupt, they arise and fall at unexpected and even more so inconvenient times. And to me, apart from the ways in which we were having a, a faculty senate meeting this morning and talking about faculty promotions, which of course means you have to talk about how you measure faculty success. But one of the ways I think in which um, we at Naropa should and do measure faculty success is to look at how shockingly unexpected and how truly inconvenient the classroom experience is for the faculty and the students who are participating. <laughs> um, that's the most important, uh, that's a real goal, and it's really important to, to experience that. I have great confidence in our faculty that they will inconvenience you significantly over the next, <laughs> over the next uh, two semesters. So I want to also, as Janet said, welcome you to the start of this year. Um, there's going to be an incredibly rich array of visitors coming to Naropa this fall, teaching, lecturing, performing, uh, and we'll be sending out lots of notices. It seems overwhelmingly busy this fall, which or maybe it's not, but it feels that way. Um, this is Wednesday, and these Wednesday lunch hours will continue to be community time throughout the course of the year. Uh, as we started last year, some of these Wednesdays will be planned and you'll get a sense of topics and an opportunity to engage. And some is going to be open for general conversation across the community with Naropa staff and faculty leadership. Um, so we'd really invite you to participate in any way that you can in, in these Wednesday afternoons. Uh, and as I mentioned about in introducing new staff, you'll soon get from me a more comprehensive kind of written report on the various programs and initiatives that we're working on, a kind of a, a thermometer of how things are at Naropa. They will be both happy and sad in various ways. They will be encouraging, however, in every way. Uh, I can, that much I can say, and I'll send something out shortly uh, to all of you. So I want to welcome you to the beginning. I want to thank Naropa. This is his 1,000th birthday, in case anybody, yes, it's nice. It's kind of cool. We haven't had a cake, but we'll do something about that. Uh, and I just welcome you to enjoy uh, the semester here, enjoy your time, take advantage of the fact that this is a place filled with committed human beings that um, you want to relate in their way, and uh, I encourage you to figure out a way to engage, so thanks. That's our president. Thank him again. So Professor Junior Burke, who is a core associate professor in the School of Arts, is a novelist, dramatist, and a lyricist. He's also the former chair of the Naropa's Department of Writing and Poetics, and is currently working with Lorenzo Gonzalez to design a BA in open performance, performative arts in addition to teaching. 
He's going to come at this time and lead us in spontaneous poem. Welcome, Professor Junior Burke. Uh, Junior Burke couldn't be here today. I'm Robert Spellman. Um, and knowing that I was going to lead a little more volume, please, come on, get it together, for God's sake. Now, let's hear it for our, oh, my God. There's a point where cooperation ends and sarcasm takes over. You know. Let's hear it for our pack crew today, doing a wonderful job. Mm. Keeps going down. It's, it's like my first date or something. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so knowing that I was going to be directing the spontaneous poem today, I prepared some remarks. <clears throat> <No>. <laughs> But actually, I, I, I threw them out. Thank you, David. Because I'm going to re react before we do the poem to a couple of things. I'm going to react spontaneously to a couple of things that were said already. Uh, first of all, um, Dr. Kramer's uh, account of her early viewing experiences. I have one of my own. Um, uh, when I was in the second grade, I think, this was the first. Um, letter that I ever wrote to anybody that I didn't know, and it was to the Flintstones. <laughs> and um, I was in the second grade at a Catholic school, <laughs> the Blessed Sacrament School, and, um, and uh, around November they were going to show, I was a big fan of this program, you know, and they were gonna, around November they were, gonna, they were advertising the, the Flintstones Christmas, and so I wrote them a letter, I found out the address, it was Hanna-Barbera Productions, ABC Television, whatever it was, and I wrote the letter that said, dear so-and-so, um, being prehistoric, did not the Flintstones predate Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard back from them, the bastards. <laughs> And President Luce remarks about um, Dr. King um, made me think about uh, something that I heard. And I think I don't think it's apocryphal. I think it's true that Dr. King had, you know, of course, remarks prepared at the March on Washington. But at some point, the great uh, gospel singer Mahalia Jackson was either on stage or near the front, and just started calling out to him, "Tell him about the dream, Michael." His name was Michael Martin Luther King Jr. Tell him about the dream, and that's when he spontaneously um, went into "I Have a Dream," which he hadn't really planned on doing. So, um, spontaneity has its place, <laughs> you know. So we're going to do the spontaneous poem today, and um, I have some names here in the bucket in the fishbowl. I'm going to pull out a name. Here's how, here's how it works. Is, do we have a calligrapher? We don't. Oh, oh, okay, jeez, okay. All right, so we're just going to, we're not going to write down the words, the lines, to say, or somebody is, right? Is it? Okay. All right, somebody's going to write down the lines. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pull out names out. There's eight lines that we're going to do. And uh, President Leaf and I were talking before. I don't know how it was arrived at eight, but at some point it was arrived at eight um, years ago. And so we have eight lines. So I call, I pull a, a name out of the fishbowl and um, read that name, and then that person stands, and in standing, they also, as we say at Naropa, take their seat, which means that they just get centered, and there's no thinking, no writing, you know, um, and a line will occur to you, and you will share it, and we'll wait for you, we'll wait for you. No, no rush, you know, you'll share it. 
And um, full disclosure, the one time that I ever got to do this when I was out in the audience, I totally had a line prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. As my guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, says, uh, no life is wasted. You can always be a bad example. So, um, <laughs> so don't do that. And the, the line was pretty good, though. I was, it was when I was chair of the Writing and Poetics, and the line was, a penny saved makes Jack a dull boy. And I was actually hoping for a bigger budget for, you know, for, the, for the writing program. But that's why I was... Didn't work, I don't think. So, okay, so uh, <laughs> enough. But uh, so, so I'm going to pull the name out, and you're going to, and then you're going to come up with a line. And don't write, don't, so don't, if you have a line ready, get rid of it and stand up and be, you know, it's not about looking good, it's not about writing, it's just about being. So here we go. I hope I'm reading this right. Um, okay, so butterfly. I'm sorry? <laughs> Do you want to stand up? <laughs> What's that? Stand up. <laughs> Hello. Hello, okay. Um, that is when the butterfly stands up and uh, floats across a lot of thought bubbles. That is when the butterfly stands up and floats across a lot of thought bubbles. Got that? Okay. Thank you very much for getting us started. Feel like Vanna White or something. <laughs> okay. Um, Jamie or Jaime Dugan? Is it? Jamie Dugan? Not, <laughs> not here either. Okay. No? Jamie's not here? Brie Livitz. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Haley Wilson. Bless your heart. <laughs> And we, oh. Hello? and we feel in our hearts a soaring acceptance. When we feel in our hearts a soaring acceptance. It was actually and. And we feel in our hearts a soaring acceptance. Who's recording this? Okay, thank you. And we feel in our hearts a soaring acceptance. Thank you very much. Edward Guyan. Sorry. Of the <clears throat> of the gifts and burdens that we've come to bear. Of the gifts and burdens we come to bear, we have come to bear. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Is it uh, Pam Wickenmaster? Ian. I'm, I'm <laughs> Next year we're doing <laughs> we're doing this on a keyboard. Okay. <laughs> Ian. with gratitude for those who were born before us and for our unborn mind. With gratitude for those who were born before us and for our unborn mind. Thank you. Anira and Knapp. This expanse stretches for hours. This expanse stretches for hours. I think that's five lines, right? <laughs> I don't know. Ground, grounded? <laughs> okay. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Apparently we are. So. <laughs> I'm Jo Lynn. Heart racing. Ah la 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 ho. <laughs> okay, I heard heart racing and. Ah la la ho. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> what do I know? Spell and you're doing this next year. <laughs> Dennis Kerr. Feeling rooted in deep compassion. Was it getting rooted in deep feeling? Com feeling rooted in deep compassion. Thank you. EDJ. And this will be our final line.
the new butterfly wings were able and willing to travel that space. Can we have it one more time? Uh, those butterfly wings were able and willing to travel the space. Those butterfly wings were able and willing to travel the space. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's eight lines. And I think we now should hear them all put together. Jovanita, would you mind if somebody gave you a microphone reading them? Would that be? Well, it's spontaneous. You got to do it. <laughs> okay, so please correct me if I got this wrong. That is when the butterfly stands up and floats across a lot of thought bubbles. And we feel in our hearts a soaring acceptance of the gifts and burdens that we've come to bear with gratitude for those who are born before us and for our unborn mind. This expanse stretches for hours. Heart racing, ah, la, 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 ho. Feeling rooted in deep compassion the new butterfly wings were willing and able to travel the space. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Junior, for leading us in that spontaneous poem. And you have. At this time, I'm going to invite the president again to come at this time and open the ear for us. That's fine. So I'm going to. Uh, I'll open the year by ringing the gong three times. Uh, I'll warn you now uh, that you'll never unhear those three gongs. Uh, so that's the warning and that's the opportunity. Uh, and then when, I think then we're done. Yes, then we're done and there are refreshments out in the pavilion. I don't have any, I have no idea. I have no idea, or do we just leave as a mob or in some, in some orderly fashion? Mob. All right, yeah. It's definitely my preference, but I just wanted to make sure, so all right. Thank you all.